The last couple videos have been a celebration of Batman Beyond's 25th anniversary and today we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the start of Justice League Unlimited. The premiere episode introduced us to the DCAU's Green Arrow, so it's only fitting that I show you how I made mine. I'll also have a brief glimpse at how my Captain Adam came together too since he was another key player in that episode. Take a seat and let's go right into his recipe. Oliver Queen's recipe went through a couple different versions before I settled on my final choice. I planned my first 30 customs at the same time, and his first take used what I felt were the best parts available. His torso and head changed a couple of times, but his arms and legs stayed the same. I was planning to use the Gods and Monsters Superman legs since it seems like the designers made slight color tweaks to Ollie's legs for the character model in that movie. I mentioned how I was planning my early customs and that's where some recipes get their mix of leftovers from, i.e. Blight or Derek Powers. Links above if you didn't catch those videos yet. I tend to change my mind a bit if I come across better parts. If I remix one recipe and replace it, that leaves leftovers to make someone else better. Then another changes and someone else gets better. It can be a slippery slope. That's a bit of a warning to not get too carried away Frankensteining recipes because you can really get lost in the planning if you let yourself. I think the figure where I learned to finally just use what I had and make the best of it was my Gorilla Grodd, but he's a whole different story for another time. Back to Mr. Queen. You can use any mix of parts, but the combo I was most happy with was this one. Superman's shoulders with TNBA Batman's forearms on a Deathstroke torso and a copy of Slade's head. I changed the torso because I originally thought Oliver wasn't that big of a guy, until I went back and looked at clips. He's huge. Look at him next to Green Lantern. This led me to revising him to the much larger chest and arm pieces, which in turn made me look for a bigger head. The alternate Superman was way too small to go on this new body, and since it was Slade's torso in the first place, his head worked perfectly. The patch wasn't going to be a problem either since I'd be making him with his mask on anyway. That's the last ingredient we needed for his recipe, so now we can start modifying him. Since we chose such on-model parts for Ollie's recipe, there isn't a whole lot of dremeling needed before we get to sculpting. I only had to cut off and smooth out Batman's gauntlet spikes, erase the torso lines, then dremel down his collar, a little bit of hair to fit the hat, and lastly the tops of Superman's shoulders a bit so his chest piece thing can fit over them all right. After that bit of dremeling you can move on to sculpting. I started with adding some epoxy to his forearms to begin shaping his long glove-like things. Then I filled in the area that was left after removing Deathstroke's belt. Next I tried the first round of sculpting his turtleneck. I say that because I think I made three or even four attempts before I was happy with it. Then while those parts were curing I moved up to sculpting on the head. I started with the base shape of his hair and then we'll end up adding the hat later. Much like his collar, the hat was also about three or four rounds of trial and error. Next we'll continue building up the shape of his arm guards, one rectangular piece at a time. This seems to work best compared to slapping some epoxy on and trying to cut the rectangle out. It's much cleaner, but it will take longer as there are 24 hours between each layer to air cure. If you're really in a rush, you can actually dremel or sand it after 6 hours and then sculpt on top of it, but it's still technically curing at that point. You'll see that I kind of bounce around to different areas while others are curing so I can just keep things moving. It may look random, but it's all planned to avoid any fingerprints on fresh epoxy while working on others. Another tip when sculpting the gloves or any straight area is to press a glob of epoxy down as flat and thin as you can then cut away what you don't need to make your hard lined shape. Here I'm refining the hat shape by sharpening the sculpt to make it match the character model. I started out with epoxy on him but for the first time in a long while I switched to green stuff again. Will it save the day? I used green stuff once a few years ago on my Mercy Grave skirt but was not at all pleased with the results. It was all lumpy and chunky and was pretty tough to work with. It turns out after some googling and friendly encouragement from Instagram user Invincigaz that my green stuff had expired and wasn't supposed to do that at all. Luckily it pretty much peeled right off and I could try again. I bought a new package of it, affiliate link in the description, and was so much happier with the results this time. I forgot to say the main reason to use green stuff on Ollie, aside from the perfectly themed match with green arrow, is that it ends up being a little flexible. The more green in your ratio mix, the more rubbery it is. The more blue you add, the tougher it gets. I wanted more flexibility to still be able to lift his arms under his curved shoulder pad things. I also used it here on his abdomen so it could still turn his waist over to pose him correctly with his bow. The more I use it, the more I'm considering switching to it altogether. I still have a ton of epoxy to use though, so I'll kind of switch off and on and use it where I need flexible parts. Same deal here. 
I figured it best to have the protruding goatee be rubbery in case he fell at any point. I didn't want it to break off. Time to add his signature mask. Coil up some compound and shape it around the eyes. Press it on so it thins out and then cut away to make the right shape. Now I'm continuing his vest shape up and have switched back to epoxy since it doesn't need to flex and the package of green stuff is so much smaller than the amount of epoxy I have. It should almost be called gold stuff instead since it's so valuable. It's at this point that I notice I miss sculpting the edge of his vest under his arms. I'm also doing second or third takes on things that don't quite look right. You can see that I switched the hat on my third round to be made from green stuff since it too juts out and needed to be flexible to prevent any accidental breakage. Dremel down anything that still turned out too thick and then sand it all smooth. Once all the dust clears, it's time to paint him. As has been the trend with this guy, even his paints had second round attempts. I started out using this dark green color for his main color, but later realized it was too dark. For his pants, I first used this green color, but was basing his colors off this character model I found online. Once I took a separate look at the actual colors used in the show, I changed my mind. His main green went brighter and more yellow and more saturated, and the pants went darker and much less blue. I managed to nail the shirt color the first time, though. His skin color is the standard color I've been using for all of my customs. Once all the greens are on, it's time for that glorious cell shaded accuracy. Black takes over quite a bit on his boots and vest piece, but just look at your reference to get the shapes right. Oh yeah, look at all that cool green and black combo. His head uses all the same colors from his body, except for one major addition. This yellow for his hair and goatee. He's looking really good, but he's missing a key component or two to keep his namesake. His green arrows and bow. I needed to also make his backpack quiver to hold all of his arrows too. As has been customary for this project, I started out with one idea for his large stock of arrows and then changed my mind when it wasn't working. Same for the arrow feathers and heads. I tried epoxy first, but when it came time to refine them with a the Dremel, they flew right off. I broke out the green stuff again, because another plus with it is how much stickier it is. It can be a little tougher to work with because it's so sticky, but it adheres so much better to things than epoxy. This allowed me to take the Dremel to it after curing and create my arrow feathers without any issues. I also chose to simply keep the color of the green stuff for the cylindrical arrowheads instead of painting them. I did add dots of UV paint for the lights, but that was all they needed. For the quiver pack, I wanted to reuse the Deathstroke figure's back sheath to make it removable, like how a produced figure might have it. When looking at the sword, I saw the shape of Green Arrow's feathers in there at the bottom and thought I could cast it to make the ends of the arrows that stick out of the quiver. I used my molding putty to cast both the insert peg and the end of the sheath, but neither was going to work. The peg mold turned out a little deformed and the arrow cast was going to take too many days making one of those at a time. Back to the drawing board. I decided to use the actual sheath since I had a couple of them from multiple death strokes for fodder. I cut the top and bottom off and then began sculpting the basic shape with epoxy on top of it. For the ends of the arrows sticking out of the quiver, my next idea was to imitate the very core of animation itself. I essentially made my own cell arrows. If you don't know how traditional animation is made, the very simple version is that they paint onto transparent sheets. I ended up doing the same thing by cutting out a figure bubble and drawing and painting on the arrowheads. I made two rows and cut out the negative spaces between them, then inserted them into the soft clay of the quiver before it dried. Be sure you cut the insert long enough so it has a solid base holding it in. Look at that, you look pretty convincing on camera. The last thing is his bow. I made it easy on myself and simply dremeled the inscription details off a Toy Biz Lord of the Rings Legolas bow. Just dremel a little extra out of the middle to match Ollie's bow's shape. Paint it green and now he's ready to go shoot some dirt bags. Another key player in this premiere episode is the military officer, Captain Adam. I actually kind of based my figure off his appearance in Season 2 where he takes a lot of damage battling Superman. Because of that battle, I knew I wanted him to look formidable up against the Justice League Superman figure. That meant making him pretty large because that Superman has quite the wide frame. I was originally going to use either a TNBA Batman or STAS Superman torso, but decided to simply match Superman up against his own torso. I still ended up using the TNBA Batman legs and then used my trusty Gods and Monsters Kirk Langstrom head. I did extend his jaw slash chin down some because Nathaniel was drawn with a pretty long face, so I wanted to match that. The body revisions only required dremeling Superman's chest symbol and boots off, adding cuff rings for his gloves and boot tops, modifying his hair and the aforementioned chin, and then giving him his own unique chest emblem. 
I painted him using these five paints, plus black. The season two episode I referenced is Flashpoint. In that episode, there's a very memorable fight between Adam and Superman, and I wanted to try and capture it in some way. I ended up painting his eyes with glow-in-the-dark orange and found and repainted some Marvel Legends fireball accessories to match. What really put him over was my idea to use invisible UV paint and give him his post-Superman battle damage cracks all over. Check him out in full UV mode and then see how his orange parts glow afterward. These are the kinds of paint features I wish would get incorporated as action features into some figures. They're functional for photography and don't require any extra tooling. Now I'm not sure how tooling compares to paint apps and cost, but it seems like it'd be cheaper, no? Anyway, that wraps up today's video. I hope you like seeing the Emerald Archer and Captain Adam come to life. Follow me on Instagram if you want to see more customs like these and all of my latest work. Also, if you're on there and make some of your own customs, I'd love to see them. It's really energizing to be a part of this customizing community and we can all join together and inspire each other. Thanks for watching. Drop a like if you enjoyed this video and subscribe for more monthly content like this and occasional shorts featuring tips or additional customs. Our next video will be returning to Neo Gotham to look at two more classic Season 1 villains, Shriek and a quick look at Spellbinder. Check out the rest of my catalog of videos while you wait for that next one. Have a good one, and happy customizing.